his spiritual son. So he's my father in Hawaii. We are here in November of last year in the, in the end of the world in the Patagonia, Argentina. So let's start to, to say uh, something about bone density, because all these uh, fragile bones start with bone density. So the, the, the bone density, this is the graphic of the bone density of um, normal persons that reach the peak at 18 years and then goes uh, in a horizontal line and then goes down after 50. That's normal, normal. And uh, that could be a, a person with a, with a rickets, but the person without all eye, the expectation of life is less. So it goes uh, maybe between 30, 50 years, depend on the classification of the OI. But what I, I want to say here, that I would like to change these lines, the red put it in green and the green put it in blue. That's, that's the goal, to improve quality of life of the patients. Um, osteoporosis, uh, you can see in different problems, but osteogenesis imperfecta may, may, is for sure is the, one of the worst. The, the, the worst uh, uh, osteoporosis. To, to treat osteoporosis or to treat patients with OI, you, you need a team. You, you need all these uh, doctors and, and technicians around, uh, around the patients. And the best thing is to, to have all these people and in, 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 uh, professionals in, in the same building uh, around the, uh, working around the, the health of the patients. Classifications, which uh, the ones I like, is a very simple. Is uh, uh, you know mild, uh, you know uh, very soft uh, OI, then the mild, then severe, and the lethal one. So one, one, two, three, um, four. These are classifications of 2014 of Van Dyck and Silens. Silens have a old classification that we use also, and there is like more than 20 different types of genetic, but for surgeons, this classification of bandic and silens is very practical. I'd like to tell the, the parents that the, the bone is a, like a column. And the column, you know, that's made of um, a scaffold of iron and concrete. When you mix all this, so the structure is very strong. But if one of the, one of these is weak, like in this case, the collagenum is the iron uh, scuffle. So if you have a bad iron scuffle or you have in the bone a bad collagen, so you have a weak column and the, and the column can't break. Um, if it breaks, so you have to put a cast or you know, some, some immobilization, and then you have a secondary osteoporosis. So we have to break this circle to improve quality of life. So what I'm gonna talk today is about surgical solutions, but to start with surgical solution, the first tip uh, is to know the medical treatment. So you're not only a surgeon, you have to know about the sickness, about osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, you, you know that good nutrition with vitamin D and calcium is important for these patients. And some patients have to have um, a supplement of uh, vitamin D. They use uh, bifofanates uh, like um, solindronic acid or palmidronate is important. So uh, I always follow the, the protocol of Dr. Gloriex uh, from Montreal. Uh, the sun exposure is it's important. It's only 10 minutes a day uh, or 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes a day is important to do the vitamin D function very well. So uh, let's start now with surgical considerations. So you, we can correct with uh, osteotomies or we can correct by guided growth. Most of the apex of the deformities are not artificial, but sometimes the patient needs a, a plate with um, my preference is the, the ones that are flexible, like this one, the hinge plate that uh, had a flexibility. And that's this idea of uh, Dr. Danny Green uh, from New York, my friend also. Uh, so uh, this, this uh, um, tension band, like uh, Peter Steven uh, named, who, who is he's the father of the idea of tension band concept and guided growth 
it can work for, for a Cora like this, a Cora or Apex. In this case, is a lack of uh, extension of the knee. You can use it, I, I use it in this case too, like you see here, to, to hinge plates in this case, and uh, it works. And the other, the other Cora is here, so uh, values of the tibia, um, you can see with the test, you do with a panoramic view of the lower limbs. And here, now you have correction. Because do correction of the coras that are in the, in the um, epiphysis or in the metaphysis is very difficult. So if you can use um, guided growth better. Um, but we're going to talk now uh, about rotting. Now, why rotting? Because the, the nail support the bone that is weak. It's like a uh, steering effects. So you can guide the bone during the growth and the, you can reduce the rate of fractures. And um, if you have a fracture, it's gonna be less difficult to treat it because the, there's a uh, displacement is less. Uh, always plan, the planification, the, the plan of, uh, uh, of a surgery is important. You, you can do a plan with the x-ray that is, uh, and you, you're gonna have a very good idea where you're gonna do the osteotomies. Um, you, you need an AP view and don't trust only one view. You have to like, like every, and everything in orthopedic, you, you need the other one. And here you, you can see that it uh, looks like a good alignment, but if you see the lateral view, uh, we have an um, anticorrupt and a big one. So we, we have to follow some rules to do osteotomies. And I like these rules. Uh, rule one, uh, is, is a rule that says if you do the osteotomy in the same place where the cora is or the apex, uh, so there is no displacement or translation, okay? But if you do the rule two, if you have a, um, a deformity and you do the osteotomy in the upper part or down part of the cora, you, you're not doing in the cora. So, you know, in this case, in this picture, you can see that's down. Uh, the cora, and uh, you're going to have, we are going to have a translation, but these translations, translations are going to be correct. I'm going to give you an example like this one. Here is a patient with a oblique plane. You can see in the AP, you can see a virus. E and, and uh, kind of a lateral, it's not a perfect lateral because I have a external rotation. It's very difficult to do a lateral on patient to have a rotation. But the, with the, these two, you can see there's an oblique plane. So it's anterolateral curve. So it's a oblique. But we, we can do a, um, a plan with this. So here in the, in the blue line, we have the, the uh, axis. Oh, yeah, you have the axis of the proximal part, anatomical axis of the proximal part. The green is the anatomical axis of the distal part. So we have one cora here, but this, this cora, uh, we, we, we want to put it in two. So we draw the, the next line. So we're gonna have two coras. So we can do two osteotomies, okay? So what we, can, we want to do is to put it straight, in this case with a telescopic rod, a facier, uh, and then see what happened here. What was wrong there? What, what it fails? Because they started in a wrong entry point. So if you remember, the, you place the nail in the anatomical axis. Have to go from, from the piriform fossa, and then you do osteotomy, I go straight to the middle of the knee. So this is the code I use in this case. Uh, I didn't use these two. I could use it too. Uh, there's another technique. Uh, uh, you have a several trusses, a rigid several trusses here, and you have another rigid several trusses. So I prefer to do osteotomy just in the middle, a little bit up of the first cora, and then we have um, osteotomy, uh, the, the side of the osteotomy with the rule two. So it, it has to be a uh, translation, a little translation, because we're very close to the, the first core. Okay, so we're holding the two serotrosis and the osteotomy, and it works nicely. We have to know the instruments, and it's very important to know one of the tricks of the, these instruments is that the rimmers are oversized. So if you rim 3.2, you're not rimming 3.2, you're rimming 
um, something more uh, enough to feel the the nail uh, goes uh, smoothly. The position of the patient, uh, Dr. Fassier taught me this position is nice. I mean, it's not a, a, a lateral. Uh, it's kind of a middle between lateral and supine. It's like 45 degrees of uh, uh, in like an oblique position. So it's, it's very nice because you, you can see this hip and then you can see the other hip with the, with the C-arm. The, 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 the right table and the, the right C-arm and your best friend and this are you, is going to be the technician of the x-ray. So the technicians have to know what you're doing and what are the positions you need to, to orientate the, the surgery. And the teamwork. Here, in, uh, this uh, picture from Saudi Arabia and uh, three different hospitals with all my friends. And all these guys were learning OI uh, and uh, the nurses, they do a great job, but they have to know what we are doing and they, know, they have to know where, where, uh, how the instruments work. I like to draw, I, I like it. Uh, so I like to draw, first what I do, I draw the patella. So that gives me during the surgery, uh, uh, orientate me uh, the position of the leg because it's the, the deformity is so crippled like here. Uh, so I like to draw the deformity uh, because I, I do this surgery. Sometimes I do it sitting so I can, I can see the lateral perfect perspective of this, uh, um, um, of this leg. Uh, I, I like to draw the incision also. Um, that's another big advice of Dr. Fassier. The, don't use oscillating size. Just, you don't need it. You can cut the bone normally with a, with a ronger, or you can use um, a drill and an osteotome. You, you, don't, you don't need to. The size it, it hits the bone and kills the, the source of the bone. So don't use it. These, are, these slides belongs to Dr. Fassier talks. It says, uh, so the, if you have a difficult reduction, then the main reason is a soft tissue tension. So it checks with the anesthesiologist if the patient is paralyzed or do, a, he says shortening. I don't like to say the word shortening, but it's a shortening, but I like to substitute this word for ostectomy. Because you're doing ostectomy, you overlap the, the I'm gonna show you later uh, how, how do, do we do that. Do you overlap the bone and then you cut it. It's not a shortening because the, the, the real length of the bones are gonna be longer. So it's, uh, it's, it's like a shortening, you're taking out bone, but the, the bones are gonna be longer. So I, I prefer the word ostectomy. He, and he said, don't fight with, with OI bone. You will always win a fracture. Uh, like in this case, you have a, a huge deformity. So you have to do osteotomy, osteotomy to overlap the, uh, you, I do osteotomy, I overlap, I take the bone enough to have the, the bone as long as the soft tissue. And with the soft tissue with uh, tension enough. Uh, in this case, we, we, we could do um, uh, lengthening of the Achilles tendon, uh, but I prefer to do uh, ostectomy of the tibia. Uh, when you do a percutaneous way, uh, which is, um, I did a, a paper of my own job, and uh, the percutaneous is less, less than uh, 30%, it was like 20, 28% of the cases. Uh, and um, you can do it only in um, a very easy, uh, I mean, not easy, uh, the angulation um, is a small quantity of degrees, um, um, not difficult cases really. Um, the bone, remember the bone is weak and flat. So let's say the, the sword shape. Um, I, I always say that the telescopic uh, nail is placed in the anatomical axis. In the femur, goes from the piriform fossa to the center of the, of, the, of the knee and the center of the knee to the center of the ankle in, uh, in the tibia. Uh, very careful with the entry points. The entry points in, uh, is in the anatomical axis, like I told you. 
So if you have, if you did a mistake, go back and do it again. Don't because you're gonna uh, create uh, a deformity. In in the proximal femur, what I like to have with the C-arm this image, uh, I draw uh, with a K wire. Uh, a line from the center of the head to the tip of the trochanter and, and I go perpendicular to this line and my nail is going to go that way. So um, here now I can have a um, cervical shaft angle right with this tr little trick uh, and I can correct the valgus. Uh, uh, sometimes you have to do uh, osteotomy of the tibia. Um, that, that's not very common. Normally, it breaks when you when you do the osteotomy of the, the tibia, and you can break it with your hands also. But sometimes the, the fibula, is, especially in type one, you have to do osteotomy. In this case, I do it with a very small incision like a percutaneous uh, osteotomy. Um, you can do anterograde or retrograde. And here I can, I can tell you this, this, this thing is very important. You, you can see here a Kelly clamp or a snap. You see this snap here holding a K wire. This is the guide. So the guide, I like to hold it with this clamp. Remember, right here is the sciatic nerve. And, and uh, so you, you, you can hold the guide here so the guide don't, don't hit the sciatic nerve. And then you can re retrograde. How to measure the female components for cutting? That, that's uh, very important. Once you, you put the, you place the, the male, okay? You go back with the, with the instrument that's calling the, uh, the, it's an instrument to go, with, to, to go back and hold the, the male in place. So the male is gonna be very long, okay? So you put, another male of the same size, same diameter, and same length. So you put it, this is a concher nail trick, okay? So you, you put it um, like he, like you're seeing here, you put it backward, you put a, now an, uh, another cane clamp here, and then with, you, you can put your female parallel to the, 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 the nail you, you're using to, to measure. Here is, there is a wings of the, of the system. So I, from the wings, I cut it one centimeter. All the time, I cut it one centimeter more. That's what I call the surgical mistake. If I do a mistake, it's because it was shorter. If you do a mistake because it was longer, that's a, that, that's a nightmare because you're gonna push the, the male into the joint. And so that, that's my, my advice for the, the, the way to cut it here, cutting with the right instrument also. Uh, the, the instrument have a, a, a cutter, uh, is very nice, but for small patients, maybe you have to cut it with a, the, the normal cutter. Um, check the smoothness, uh, smoothness of the cut, um, because sometimes bends, so you have to be, very careful you you don't have these uh, um, um, things uh, banded because it's not gonna telescope okay let's talk now about proximal third of the femur in nociones imperfecta uh, the proximal third of the femur i mean the femur is the, a, a bone very difficult very different to other bones because somehow in the evolution we stand up and because we stand up the the proximal part of the femur is different to other animals. So we save a lot of energy with, with this uh, um, uh, design we have. And uh, that what happened now is that uh, we have a weak point. We have weak point in the, in the neck. We have a weak point in the lateral cortex and we have another weak point in the subtrochanteric area. The, this um, article of, um, Journal of Mechanic, and they found in OI patients that this three, there is also four points because there is a um, weakness in, in, in the metaphysis of, uh, in the union of metaphysis with, with diaphysis of the distal third. So do fragile bone needs, uh, need, needs um, intermedular nail? 
Yes, because the, the collagen deficit makes bone fragile and the bone must be protected from, from epiphysis to epiphysis, from, from the, remember, in femur and in tibia and in humerus, should protect from epiphysis to epiphysis, thus to avoid fractures and displacement. Uh, due to the new treatment in Y, better quality of life, okay, and better function uh, and more activity. We have more activity, more exposure to mechanical forces, more injuries. In lower limbs, the proximal third of the femur is the weakest point. So um, Dr. Richard Cruz from uh, Alfred DuPont Hospital uh, asked me to um, uh, write a chapter of, about proximal femur and osteogenesis imperfecta. And um, with these two friends, uh, Carlos Vargas, uh, who is uh, working now in uh, DuPont Hospital, and now he's gonna go with, uh, to Baltimore <coughs> uh, with uh, Hessenberg, uh, and um, Alfredo Santana, um, with these two friends, we wrote a, a chapter and we found three types of deformities of the proximal femur in OI. In the type one is a subtrochanteric oblique plane. Okay, so that's the most common. The type two is a, a deformity in the, in the neck and the type three is, is a, a weakness of the lateral cortex and the deformity goes like this. I'll show you one by one. So the type one, we can have anterolateral, which is the most common, anteromedial deformity or posteromedial. That's the three, the, the three uh, types of the type one we found. Uh, here is a, uh, is a diagram of how the deformities show. Th these are lateral view and this AP. So you can see uh, a real oblique plane. You can feel it, you can palpate. Uh, with your hands, the deformity. is the most common. The deformity apex or cora is an anterolateral direction and also have external femoral torsion always. Uh, there is, this is the duration of the deformity and the type one usually is uh, palpable. Uh, internal rotation, abduction and flexion movement are limited. And in some cases resemble a uh, coxa but uh, like uh, Dr. Facier wrote, in a, in a paper, he, he called it falsa coxabara or false coxabara. The, the apex or cora is subtrochanteric in the type one. It, that's the most common one. You can see it all very common in, and we're gonna talk about this, how to solve this with a surgery. And now you, you can fix it like this. Here's another example of the anterolateral. Uh, this is type A1 and is with the nail. This, this is a patient of uh, 14 years old with a, with a nail in. Um, uh, he has uh, like five years with that nail and it breaks in, in, it was a deformity already and it breaks. And we use, a, a, in this case, we use a gap nail. A gap nail is, a, is a, not telescopic. This, this patient is 14 years old. He stopped growing. Uh, the devices are closed. And, and here is the nail with, with, uh, with this uh, a, a very fantastic structure. We can hold the proximal femur and lock it. So it's very nice, uh, difficult to use, but very, very good results. And type 1B is the anterior medial deformity in the subtrochanteric area is less frequent and less obvious in the clinical. It's, it's, it, you have to, you can palpate, but it's in, it's in the back. The bump is in the back of, uh, of the thigh. Um, the 1C is a posterior medial deformity at the sutrochanteric area. It can be observed in OI uh, type three, which is very, very uh, uh, not frequent. And 1B and 1C uh, type have a history of being treated due to a fracture by, by an uh, orthopedic reduction. Uh, now we we are we're going to talk about type two. Type two we have uh, the type two A. This is a cervical deformity affects the cervical shaft angle. The deformity is a true coxa vara. 
It is more common in patients that have surgery on the femur shaft with the aim nail. So you can see it, patients that have a nail, and the only weak point is the neck. Now, because we put a, a, a nail before, so the, the neck is unprotected, like in this case, all these cases had. Uh, to hold this problem, you can do it with uh, this technique uh, of uh, Dr. Facier in the article, Dr. Facier and Gloriex. You can see uh, K-wires holding with, with a wire here around with a circlash. It, it, that's one way to do it. This is the, the Facier technique. Uh, type, uh, we, we found only three patients with this type. Is we can have a fracture of the neck without having the, the nail. But these patients always have a huge external femoral torsion. So uh, my theory about this is that the, the ex external torsion is so big that the neck uh, um, uh, impinge the acetabulum and the patient could have a fracture. Like in this boy of six years old, uh, here it, it doesn't look like a fracture, but you can see this line. And month, uh, days later, we could see it uh, was treated for another guy. So you can, they, they could see a, a fracture. And they treated it like uh, they didn't know the patient was OI because it was a, 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 a mild uh, OI. So they, they found a fracture here and they, they, put, a, they put two screws like a, like a normal patient. So what happened? The, the patient have a, a pseudoarthrosis and the virus was in progress, more and more and more pain. So, and we found another deformity here, uh, very common in OI, the, uh, the, this deformity here. So we have to hold this part and we'll do another osteotomy here to put the nail. So we could use the fascia technique, but we prefer to use a um, customized device with this company, uh, TechFit. And we did a, a plate with arms that ho will hold the bone, doing one osteotomy here to correct this coda. And here we did another osteotomy to, to do a valgus osteotomy, uh, putting a fascia dual nail and, and the plates. And um, we, th th was, th this was the, the prototype of the, of the system. And um, uh, we did the surgery. Uh, we put the nail, we put the plate, uh, hold the whole thing, and it works. Uh, now we have uh, the dual osteotomy heels, and uh, one month ago, uh, I took out the plate, and I, I left, the, I left the, the nail, because the, the patient needs the nail. But now we have a, a normal, normal um, uh, shaft angle. In the, in the, in the type three, it's not uncommon. Uh, it's more common if you do a mistake with the entry point. <clears throat> so it's, it's a weakness of the lateral cortex and uh, the nail, the, the virus is going to be huge. Uh, it's going to resemble uh, um, um, uh, a congenital problem, but it's not. And, I mean, it's, it's the, the nail, uh, in, instead of go through piriform fossa, when do the big trochanter lateral part, like a, like a, another nail. So you create a problem. I mean, we call it the, the type three, which is a fracture of the big trochanter and lateral cords that could be caused by, by failure of the entry point. Uh, how can you solve this problem? Now we have a cosa vara, we have a, a fracture here, um, and this is holding nothing. So we have to go to the piriform fossa, uh, do the osteotomy here. Now I place the nail first, and uh, to hold rotation, you can hold it with a plate. This, uh, this plate is a supplement. I mean, you, you, you're going to put the plate, and you have to take it out in three or four months. That's what I'm doing. You have to take it out, because once it, this heals, you don't need this plate. Um, about uh, the approach consideration of the, the proximal femur. Uh, the first is position. Then you have to draw the deformity and you have to draw the approach. Then we have here, we have here uh, the muscle. We have the muscle here. 
and uh, this is the, the lateral vasus. You can see the lateral vasus, and we have to cut here. Okay, the first thing is is a is a lateral and posterior approach. Once you see the fascia lata, you have to cut the fascia lata just in the place where we're finished. Then we do incision here. We take, I'm gonna show you a picture now, a movie. Okay, and, and, and when you see the bastus, you have a little cut here. Okay, like here. This is a little cut in the bastus. And now this is the fascia lata, ilio, uh, iliotibial band. And this is the bastus. Okay, and now we have the deformity. Okay. Then we expose the bone without taking out the periosteum. You overlap. Once you overlap, you cut the distal part because you need the one you need long is the proximal one. And then you put the nail with the technique. Okay. So let's see this, this patient. This is the, the, the right and this is the left. We're going to do the surgery here in the, the right. And then we have. Uh, this very big deformity. This is the patient, the OR. This, I draw the deformity. You see, see, see the, the, the skin incision is a 90 degrees. You're gonna see what happened. Uh, here is the fascia lata here, and here is the muscle. You, I, I did a cut here. And what you're gonna do, see, I like, I like to use the Kelly clamp, the snap, to do this maneuver. Can see here. Okay. Now, see the head here. Here's a then very almost ninety or more than ninety degrees deformity, and I can expose the whole bone without only cutting one muscle. Okay. This is a deformity. Now, I overlap. I cut whatever I have to cut to put everything straight. And uh, I prefer to cut in distal part when one, one doing the osteotomy in the proximal part. I will go, I'm going here retrograde to the piriform fossa, anterograde to the distal part, a rim both, and I, I can put, and here I'm gonna have a translation, but the mechanical axis is gonna straight and the anatomical axis are also. So I have my bone straight, I see the incision, remember, was almost 90 degrees, and now it's slightly almost straight. Uh, here is another example, uh, uh, same deformity, very common. And uh, here's the maneuver. So with, I'm doing two homens. And now, see, it's like a pillow in a banana. And see the periosteum is safe, okay? It's very important this consideration, the femoral anteversion, because when you when if you're going to use a plate or when you finish the surgery, you're going to put a cast. You have to know what anteversion you're going to leave. If you're going to put a plate or a gap nail, so you have to know that here you have the direction of the neck because you can put a K wire just in the middle of the of the neck. And the and here this this wire I'm, 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 I'm signing here this this wire is is in the uh, axis of rotation of the knee. So remember the anteversion the anteversion is the angle be, between the axis of rotation of the knee or a line that goes in the back part of the of the knee and the axis of the uh, of the neck. So this angle, you can see it here. If you're going to put a plate, you put these two wires, and then you, you can put uh, hold it the, the, with a plate to uh, hold the whole thing. And if you're going to put a cast, you have to remember what is the right position. So the longer proximal fragment holds is better. Uh, once we do the osteotomy, we have to overlap the proximal and the distal fragment to measure the ostectomy. This way we can avoid tension of the soft tissue. About surgery, type one uh, FD nail is the, is the golden standard in patients with open physis. Uh, the type two, uh, valgus can be stabilized with a supplement. 
which could be a K wire as a fascia technique, or I prefer a, a plate, a locket plate. Uh, and in adults, I can uh, I like to use the gap nail. In the type three, uh, the, the so, uh, solutions like in the type two, uh, it's important to hold the neck and the trochanter. But in this case, the lack of the lateral corte of the trochanter makes it more difficult. So the, the locket plate in children use it as a supplement, it's an option, and the gap nail is a, an option in, um, in, a, in the adults because we have a, a assembly structure. So in conclusion, in, in lower limbs, uh, the proximal femur is a weak point in fragile bones. Uh, Telescopic nail is a gold standard for children's. A uh, locket plate is a supplement, it's a supplement, it's, you, you cannot use it alone. The, in, in, the intramural locking nails are an uh, option patients with vices close and the gap nail is ideal because it comes in small diameters and, and it's made, the design is made for fragile bones. So the, the purpose of these classifications is to clarify the different deformities of the proximal femur and OI and the purpose uh, of this um, chapter of this book was uh, to propose a, um, a plan to correct. And that's uh, the first part of my, uh, my lecture. Um, 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 in in, in uh, Arab is a shakran, but I'm gonna give you some tips because I have more, I, I made this talk to, Give it 40 minutes. I have 45, so I have five more minutes. Um, look at this. This is very weak. What can we do here? This patient have a lot of pain, so we can place. We can. Can we do something with that? Because it's very weak. So what I did, uh, I place a, a FB. Uh, I hold it here. I went out of the bone because nothing can place can be placed here, and hold the other. Okay, look as, it looks like a porn, popcorn bone. This is a very difficult case. So I did the same on tibia, okay, holding the calcaneus. And you know why? Why I did that? Because the pain. These patients stop to have pain in lower limbs. So uh, that, that, was, uh, that was very nice to see the patient, the patient could sleep. So that's another thing. Uh, some words about uh, spica. Uh, I don't like spicas. I, I prefer uh, I prefer to use um, uh, a soft cast um, or uh, a frame cast. Uh, if in tibia, you, you can use a cast in tibia because if you flex it, you can hold the rotation. Uh, let's talk about now adults. Uh, some some words about uh, a patient with a small bone like this one is a patient with OI, 20 years old, and now we have a six millimeter, millimeters diameter. What nail I'm gonna use here? There is no nail, there is one, but it, it wasn't. So now we have a gap nail. That was a idea of a Pega Medical, a Galvan and Parra, that's why we call it gap. And with this uh, nail, we can solve a problem like this, a patient 40 years old, I showed you before, and we, we could uh, solve the, the femur or, or the right femur with this nail 5.6 diameter. And then he got a fracture in the left and the left we could do a different, different assembly like here and we, we could lock it. The patient was very happy because it, it didn't, it, the patient doesn't need a cast. So I did, it was a fracture and it needs another stotomy to put it straight. So in three months, we had a, a heel of both. Um, each one takes three months. So it's the patient moving. This is another, another patient from uh, Lima, Peru, with a very difficult deformity. Okay, so we did a, a technique of super hip. I learned with Dor Paley. Uh, to um, correct this deformity, but I treat it like um, uh, la like a congenital deformity plus the uh, the problem that is a very fragile bone, like you see here. So uh, I did some cuts I designed and I hold it with a 
with a gap nail, I couldn't lock it, and I did a, a carry technique to, to have a uh, to pure straight. And uh, um, I, I did this um, Teddy's uh, ligament to hold the, the, the hip in place. Uh, that's very interesting. 36 years old, uh, he came to um, emergency room with a fracture. Is a, see the, the height of the patient is one meter, 10 centimeters. It's a very, very small patient. It was a very small bone and got a fracture. See the, the, the arrow here? Uh, you can see a fracture of the subtrochanteric part. And the, the patient had a plate. So it had a fracture used when the plate finished. That's why you don't have to use a plate alone. So I, I let the, the plate, I took the screws out and I put a gap nail. So, uh, and here you can see the, the gap nail locket. So uh, the patient, it, it, she, she didn't need it, um, um, a cast. Uh, here is another patient of 18 years old with a deformity. I use a gap nail also. So the nail design uh, or the gap nail is designed for weak bones and uh, bones with a small diameter. So uh, in conclusion, the fragile bones with deformities, you can correct it by guided growth or you can correct, correct it by nails. Uh, the nails in children, I prefer the telescopic one, and uh, in uh, adults, the, the gap nail is a good option uh, because the, the diameter and the design. Now I, I finish, uh, I, I have to say thank you to my friends in Saudi Arabia, and now I'm ready to answer whatever you, you want to Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank yeah. you, Dr. Miguel. It's a very long talk, I know. It's very heavy uh, information, and um, always we get uh, uh, tricks and tips and advice from you that help us and facilitate uh, treating those uh, uh, work kits. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I believe uh, Dr. Faser is here. If we can, uh, I would open the mic for him if he would like to. Uh, yes. Give a comment. Dr. Faser, the yes. mic with you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, hello. Congratulations, Miguel, for this excellent presentation. If I may add one thing in your classification, type 1C, the Ricovatum femur, I encourage my colleagues in Saudi if they see such a case, to check the hip. Because in my experience, most of these cases happen because the patient was born in a breech position and there is a risk of hip dysplasia associated with this type of deformity. That's beautiful. Dr. Miguel. Dr. Miguel? His mic is... Uh, I think it's off one. Okay, let's switch off. Miguel, unmute, unmute your mic. Yeah. We are listening to you, Dr. Miguel. Okay, now, now. Yes. Well, okay, listen. got a got a problem to unmute. Yeah, uh, that's a good advice. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, you told me that when we got together in uh, Argentina. Um, yeah, I haven't seen that, uh, but uh, you have more experience than me. Uh, I will take it on, on account. Yeah, it makes sense, but uh, because uh, these uh, very uh, difficult deformities. I have seen only in patients that had a lot of uh, surgeries before or uh, fractures and it's difficult to know where they come from. Normally, normally the patient have a uh, anterolateral deformity. That's the most common. That's why uh, uh, it's the, the easiest to, sh to show because it's more common. Uh, 
So we, we can have a um, technique to correct that. But uh, I have the opportunity to correct this, uh, the, the, ones that, the one B and one C, and that's the surgery is very difficult. So the approach is the same, but uh, you know the nerve, when you, when you open the, the, fa the fascia and you see the sciatic nerve, this over, I, I, I mean, you can see the, the nerve right away. So you have to be very careful with the sciatic nerve. What do you think, Fasier? Oh, uh, Miguel, I congratulate you because the cases you've shown are extremely difficult. And uh, I would uh, encourage my colleagues not to jump into such a case uh, without you know, several plans in head. Plan A, what you plan to do, but if it doesn't work, have a plan B, and if necessary, a plan C. And it's very important because in the middle of the surgery, you can't take half an hour to think about it. Everything must be planned in advance. And uh, in such cases, in particular the uh, Sidia Coxavara, uh, you have to be ready to do uh, what uh, Miguel uh, demonstrated with the super hip type of surgery that may often be necessary. Yes, another, another thing in the, in the type uh, where where the uh, type two where we have a uh, fracture of the neck um, yes what I saw is that the the most of the patients had um, a, um, a surgery before with a nail even a fascia du ball to be any nail so I think the the reason for that is because the nail is doing the job protecting the diaphysis and the epiphysis, but the neck becomes now the weakest part. Are you agree, uh, agree with that? I do agree, and it's what we wrote in one of the articles that we published on Coxavara. Most of our patients had, had had a nail put in the diaphysis and hence putting the neck at risk of fracture. So I always say to my colleagues and my you know, people's, people who come to, uh, to visit us, beware, look at the neck shaft angle after a femoral rotting, because if you see that this uh, neck shaft angle is getting lower and lower, protect the neck. Yes, uh, um, you protect the neck with the K-wires? I do the, the classic technique. You know, if, if uh, as long as the neck shaft angle is above 110, I don't do an osteotomy. But if it's a below 110 degrees, then I do an osteotomy and correct it. Succession with what, Dr. Fasel? What, what, what would you use for fixation if it, uh, less than one, uh, 110? Uh, the, uh, the technique with the two K wires and the circlage around. Yes, the two K wires are one anterior posterior going posterior and the posterior anterior leaving the space in the middle for the, na the nail. You need to have the nail. It's just an adjunct to the fixation. Yes, well, that's, why, that's why I insist that, that uh, Whatever you use, the K wires, uh, you can use a plate in, in, in a bigger bone. I use the K wires in very small patients. And, and, and uh, I, if you can use a plate, but the plate is, I call it, I would, I like to call it a supplement. It's some, something to, yeah, it's a supplement. It's, it's not yeah. a um, fixation thing. That's good. And Dr. Galvan will use the plate uh, isn't it, and to cross. And they remove it after uh, four months. Say it again. Uh, you will use and uh, you didn't use the uh, K wires. You are uh, used to use the uh, blade and screws, isn't it? Yeah, depend. Yeah, some depend of the 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 size. Some some now in in this time we have so many uh, sizes of uh, we have a lot of sizes of um, uh, plates, so. I use the K-wire technique, it was very good, but I found uh, since three years ago, I'm using plates. And I think the plate holds, uh, with the locket plates, now we have the plates with uh, 
variable angle of the screws. This one called EVOS, which is pretty, good, pretty nice. And in different places you, you can hold it. So if you plan uh, to do, use a plate, go with a good plate with a variable angle, which is the best, and lock it. Gotta be locked. I see. This, um, Dr. Miguel, Dr. Fasser, there is a question from uh, Dr. Tamer. Uh, he's asking, how many osteotomies are needed to place uh, FD nail in a normal bone alignment to overcome the physiological anterior uh, curvature or uh, bone? Okay, well, I'm gonna answer that. And, and uh, I would like to, to, to hear the, the opinion of Dr. Fassier. Well, when I did my own revision of my cases, um, I, ha I have to do in femur and in tibia <clears throat> from one to three. But most of the cases, as, um, because I start to learn how to do things, uh, uh, the, the average, uh, it was two osteotomies uh, for severe cases. Uh, now I'm not using three, but sometimes you have to do a three osteotomies. But that, that depends of the depends of the angulation and depends of the bone. In tibia, which is very tiny and it's not so flexible, you may surprise you need more osteotomy than the femur. When the femur is wider. So but if if I can skip one stopping, I can do it. But remember, you can win a fracture. So there's so many tricks. To, to do it in one osteotomy, but, uh, uh, but if you are not uh, um, training, so it's better to do one more osteotomy. What, what, do, you, what do you say about that, uh, uh, Pancho? I agree with you. I try uh, to do as little osteotomies as possible, meaning three osteotomies was for me relatively exceptional. If you choose, as you demonstrated uh, with your slides, appropriate positions for the Cora, with two osteotomies, you solve 95 to 98% of cases. So in a few cases, you may need a third osteotomy, but I think it's relatively rare. Okay. That's good. And another question from Dr. Ali Hashim. He's asking, uh, what's the protocol of uh, bisphosphonate, uh, pre-op and post-op uh, for OI uh, patients? Okay, uh, I like to to use the protocol of um, Montreal, the ones that uh, they use there in the Shrine Hospital. Uh, um, Dr. Fassier is involved in that. Uh, right now, I'm using the solendronic acid which is uh, every six months. Uh, the, the dose is uh, 0 0.05 milligrams per, per kilogram. So weight of the patient, uh, you can do it. You, you can, uh, the treatments in one hour or less. Um, and then we have a very good result. Before that, we were using pamidronate, which is a very nice result also. Uh, good thing about pamidronate, when you use it three months, every three months, you see the patient every three months. So you, you see the patient in the clinic. So I, you got the control. And with the solendronic acid, it's very good for the patient that lives, lives um, far away from the hospital because they have to go only one day uh, to the clinic. With pamidronate, the, the protocol was three days uh, for treatment, uh, as uh, it's very difficult for the patient that live uh, far away. So the solendronic acid is is I, is, is working. The numbers are very pretty pretty good. What, uh, Pancho, what have what you have? Oh, nothing to add. No, no, nothing to add. We do the same. Okay. We prefer though because we have lots of patients coming from far away, so the zol is more practical. Uh, for uh, patients living far away from the hospital. That's great. Another question for uh, Dr. Mohammed Osman is asking if the male component uh, of the FD nail uh, not gaining or not purchasing well uh, distally uh, devices, uh, then uh, 
whether to keep it as, it, as a such or you have uh, another technique to uh, solve this problem. He asking about the distal purchase for the male component in either femur or uh, tibia. Uh, I, I didn't understand the question. Yeah. But too long, maybe. <laughs> Uh, yes, answer that. You can help me. Yeah, no, I, I agree. This is the weak part of the fixation. It's the distal epiphysis. Okay. It leave the uh, threads of the uh, FD nail part in the middle of the epiphysis. You have almost no purchase. It, the reason why, when I put the nail, I go down to the subchondral bone. Because there, the cartilage is thick enough. You don't need to go through the cartilage, but you go down to the subchondral bone, and here you have more purchase of fixation. Same in the distal tibia, and particularly in the distal tibia, the cartilage is very thick at the ankle level, so you can go down almost to what you think is the uh, joint space but the joint space is much, but the cartilage is much thicker than you, you can think. Okay. Yes, thank you, Professor. And I think, is, I believe that checking the range of motion after, uh, especially for the ankle or knee, is very important to check for yeah. the grinding or the... Absolutely. That's good. And um, another question about the blood transfusion. How many uh, events that use uh, blood transfusion and uh, reconstructing the lower limbs or putting the FD nail for femur tibia. That we know that uh, for tibia, we can use the tourniquet for bilateral uh, tibia. But for the femurs, uh, someone of the, um, uh, the participant asking about the blood transfusion in OI patients. Blood transfusion, yeah. Um, well, when you use tourniquet in tibia, normally you don't have to use it. Uh, when, I, when I started to work with uh, OI, my professor told me that the patients bleed a lot. And uh, they, I think it's more or less the same than any patient, but the surgery could be big. So I think if you do the right incision with the techniques uh, I show you for proximal femur, uh, you, you can hold the whole thing without transfusion, but you have to be prepared for transfusion, especially in femur, especially in femur. You have to be prepared, but n maybe not in the surgery, maybe some uh, uh, after the surgery. But you have to, you have to be prepared for, for, especially for femur. For tibia, if you, if you use tourniquet, you don't need transfusion. And do you believe they are easy, uh, easier uh, uh, or easy uh, bleeder? They bleed uh, easier than the other patient, normal patient? What do you think, uh, Pancho, about uh, bleeding? Yes, they, they bleed very easily. Because yeah. Collagen is everywhere, and it seems that the collagen in the blood vessels may be affected as well. So it's not exactly the same. Uh, you know, these patients bleed a lot. And very often, the, uh, one of the causes of death for this patient is intracranial bleeding. So this is just a rupture of a vessel intracranial. Okay. I see. And uh, one question from Dr. Mazan, he asking, when, when do you stop and uh, restart by medronate, briop, and uh, post stop? Okay. You, um... If you are going to do a surgery, uh, you have to be, I mean, the, the pamidronate stop the, the action of the osteoclast. So it's very important to keep two months before and two months after surgery without the bifofanates. May I disagree? Yeah, it's more than that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. It's been proven that the biphosphonates in that you inject intra, uh, you know, in the blood, is either fixed to the bone or eliminated forty-eight hours after the injection. So, meaning you don't have to stop the biphosphonates very long before surgery. 
So we go for uh, injection until 48 hours before surgery. But stop. It's very important not to give for four months or until you see signs of healing of your osteotomies. So you don't use it after surgery for four months? Ab absolutely. Okay, I have the opportunity to, to have you here because I, I, have a, I have a question for you about the use of lipofanate in, in a, because I'm gonna talk about the um, congenital sorotrosis of the tibia next Monday. And uh, in, in the recipe of Dr. Paley, he used um, bifofanate for, for congenital sorotrosis of the tibia. And he used it two weeks before and two weeks after. Um, and because I'm, I'm using uh, bifofanate since um, 20 years ago when I started in 1999. Um, so I'm 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 afraid I mean uh, I'm afraid of uh, using bifofanate in these patients that are normal normal patients. Um, I don't see a relationship between the use of bifofanate in, in patients with uh, uh, congenital osteoarthrosis. And you're using two weeks before, and you can stop the the I mean the osteogenesis. Uh, what, what do you think about that? I would be afraid of. I, I agree with you. Personally, I've never used the biphosphonates uh, in uh, CPTs because these patients otherwise have a normal skeleton. The, the, their disease is local, not general like OI. Okay, so we are uh, answering a question for, for next talk and <laughs> next Monday. Because, but you uh, know, uh, yeah. draw changes is recipe very often. And I don't know if this one is uh, number 101 or 102. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. And, uh, but I was uh, uh, surprised in, in one um, uh, course. In, it was in Dallas, Texas. Uh, this guy from Australia, Little, David Little, was using it too in, in congenital osteoarthrosis. So, uh, I mean, all the experience I have. Dr. Gloria X, uh, since uh, 20 years ago, he's saying, don't use it before you're gonna do a, a surgery of OI. And what's, what's the difference in, uh, in between OI and uh, no, another patient? It's the same action, isn't it? But if you give too much biphosphonates, you may induce a kind of uh, osteopetrosis type of bone meaning a very dense, but still brittle bone. So be very uh, you know, afraid of using it in a normal skeleton. You know what, it's the same question because I know that David Little, the same one you just mentioned, used it in LCP. But you know, you can give to LCP patients biphosphonate that are gonna act on the entire skeleton while your target is just the femoral head. So yes. you find a way to inject the biphosphonates in the femoral head, not intravenous. You mean a Parthes disease? Parthes disease, yes, absolutely. He's been using it. Yes, yeah, that, that's uh, when I started to use a vamidronate, uh, I saw a lecture uh, that somebody was using it, but mm -hmm. And I remember Dr. Bowen, Richard Bowen was uh, uh, he was in the in the talk, and I asked him, and, and he told me, "You, we will never know if this works because there is no way to, to demonstrate it." That's great, uh, Dr. Galban, Dr. Fazer. Another question from Dr. Tamer. He said, uh, "What forces most of the surgeon?" when they started their uh, career fixing the OI patients to go lateral in their uh, femoral entry, is there fair from the ABN of the femoral head? I said, is it almost never happening in the OI with the FD nail in uh, periformis fossa as we know? I, I will let uh, Pancho, Dr. Fasier to answer that question because uh, I like his answer. 
Uh, you know, you may know why uh, Miguel is calling me Pancho. It's a nickname <laughs> that has been given to me by the South American uh, children. So it's a kind of uh, nickname for Francois, which is my first name. So regarding the, uh, the AVN of the femoral head in OI, I've been practicing now, but I stopped 30 years. More than 30 years, I've never seen one. And I've done quite a high number of OI patients. I don't know if it's the, due to the fact that we go very smoothly through the greater trochanter. It's the fact that we don't use too much remus that heat up and risk of you know, uh, damaging the, uh, the vessels, the uh, circumflex artery going to the femoral head. But I had once, once I was told that there was in Madrid uh, an um, AVN in an OI patient. So I was going to Madrid the week after. So uh, I asked Dr. Para to show me the case. And he said, oh, finally, it's not an AVN. So <laughs> I've never seen one. Yes, I have seen only two. Um, uh, when I was a resident, uh, I saw one was a, with a kuncher nail. That uh, was a fracture, and, and it was a 10 years old girl, and they put a kuncher nail. But it was a very aggressive technique. Uh, yeah, That's absolutely. the only, the only yeah. one. But I, I don't have with a, a fascia. Uh, du with the fascia dual, I don't have one, one single uh, avian. Um, Did you do one yourself? Oh, well, no. no. I'm, I'm asking uh, Dr. Altus. Yeah. Did you see an, uh, an AVN of the, uh, of the head? No. no. For me, my back is nothing. Because I would be interested if one of your colleagues, uh, people participating to this webinar, has one, I would like to know about it because it would be a case report. Uh, that's right. Is yeah, I can that, tell you, uh, I'm t talking about that, there is more problems that I have seen going by the lateral part of the lateral cortex of the big trochanter, creating a very weak uh, point of breaking, putting the fascia dual, like in the case I show you. There's more problems going, trying to avoid the piriform fossa that going to the piriform fossa. Nothing's going to happen if you do it right. That's, it. That's great. And uh, it's very common a question and very common uh, uh, scenario that we get in, uh, in our practice. If we have uh, one patient uh, diagnosed to have OI and get a femur fracture, came through the ER, do you prefer uh, to put a hip spiker and treat him uh, conservatively then later on for a uh, steatomy and uh, FD nail? Or acutely, you prefer to do uh, FD nail uh, at the initial? Yeah, if I have the opportunity, because in my hospital, the, the, the hospital I work, uh, uh, we don't see much uh, emergencies. Normally, the patients call me from another city. Uh, so I tell the, the surgeon uh, that live, you know, four hours away, and I told him, put a cast, uh, leave it like that, and the, the patients can fly to my hospital in, in, in two months or months and a half with the cast or, or three, three weeks or whatever. We can, we can make it. But uh, um, that's the way I do it. But if I have the opportunity that the patient breaks in my city and I will do the surgery the, same, the, the next day or two days after this, the the fracture, but that's not common. So, uh, Dr. Fasse, what do you say about it? It depends, uh, you know, on the deformity of the femur pre-existing to the fracture. If the femur is not deformed, I would have a tendency at the first fracture to treat the patient with a spike. But if the patient has already had a fracture and has a femur deformed, then I would proceed Directly. I see. I mean, I'm just uh, my thought. If uh, if we treat uh, them acutely, 
so will decrease the, the chance of uh, deformity. The uh, surgery will be easier at, uh, if we treat them acutely because uh, for multiple fractures treated with the cast, we are not guaranteed the uh, alignment will be uh, optimal or that it will be easier. So I mean more fracture, more deformity, the canal will be obliterated more. So um, I believe this will be more difficult. So if we treat them acutely, if the setting is uh, allowed, I believe it will be uh, better for the surgeon and for the patient. What do you think, Dr. Yeah. Pascal? Oh, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. The problem sometimes is that the fracture does not happen at the level you wish to do your osteotomy. Yeah. <laughs> so then you are stuck in a more difficult situation. But if it is the case, I agree with you, it's much faster, much easier. And for the family, it means also, uh, you know, not many hospitalization, immobilizations, etc. That's true. And a very common question, uh, Sergio asking here, uh, what's the earliest age that uh, you can uh, do FD nailing? I mean, uh, before age uh, of four? I, have, I, I, I like that question. I have a quick answer. As soon as the patient in the femur can hold a 3.2, I'll do the surgery. And that's going to happen between 18 months to 24 months, more or less if the bone is bended, actually. I mean, you have the indication to do that. That's great. Uh, Dr. Fasser, same thought or? Mm, a little bit different uh, for me. The indication for surgery is as soon as the child pulls up to stand with deformed bones. You know, we don't operate patient with straight bones. But if the bones yeah. are Home and the patient is ready to pull up to stand, if the patient is 11, 12 months, I would do the surgery. And I've done several surgeries, but generally speaking, it's more so around 18 months that it happens. I see. I received one patient, his age one year and seven months. And he got a fracture femur before he diagnosed. Then he came to my clinic already, the fracture is healed. He is now one year, almost two years, with the flexible rods uh, in femur, and uh, he's st uh, still not walking. He's not walking yet. So uh, now between two things, either to remove it uh, quickly and, uh, and put a FD in it, he's still not walking. His uh, medulla canal is uh, accepting 3.2, or uh, leave it until he's uh, start to walk and remove the flexible, flexible rods, which will be difficult and more embedded in the bone, and they do for him the statement. What do you think in this situation is better to do? But the bone is straight now? And not, uh, not straight. I, I have the x-ray if I can share the screen. Oh yeah, please. By the way, uh, Miguel, thank you for inviting me to participate to this webinar. It's, uh, it's very interesting. Yes, uh, it's, uh, you know, this coronavirus give us uh, the only <laughs> good thing about it. It's, it's one of the positive things for, from, uh, for the current thing. See, this is the, just come to it. You see the x-rays? Yes, yes. yes. Oh, that's good. This is the one. Cur uh, currently, he's one year and uh, two years. Almost, he's reaching two years. Okay, can, can I see a lateral view of this? Of yeah, the this femur? Lateral. Yeah. Well, uh, I have to start saying that the problem with the flexible nails, there's two problems. First, it's not telescopic. So in um, less than six months, maybe one year, you're gonna have uh, in the metaphysis, in the distal metaphysis, you're gonna have a, a part of the femur uncovered. I mean, uh, I, uh, I said in my talk that we have to protect the bone from epiphysis to epiphysis, okay? The perfect, perfect nail should protect from the head 
to the knee, but we don't have that. But you have to protect from epiphysis to epiphysis. And this is not happening here. Um, and it's going to be worse in, in some months. Those one thing. The other is that uh, um, the elastic nails were made to be elastic and to put it and take it out in, in as soon as the fracture heals in a normal patient. So, because they're, they're, the, these nails are too flexible and they don't protect the bone. They, 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 these nails are not uh, um, internal fixator, okay? So, but the right now, right now, uh, I leave it. I think I leave it. I think it's, it's straight. Is the, the, they're doing some job, but as soon as the the bone, uh, I mean the the nail gets short, you can go and change it because it's gonna break. It's gonna have a fracture in the distal part of the femur somehow later later on. But right now looks nice. I mean, but. Uh, but remember, it's uh, it's not the correct uh, technique. That's, that's right. And uh, another case, uh, Dr. Galban, we would like to share this. Um, May I say something say? about that? Yeah, because please, please. I I love this type of case <laughs> because I have <laughs> one thing that I used to say to everybody who comes to visit me: treat mm -hmm. patients, don't treat X-rays. That's beautiful. Okay, because this patient doesn't ask for anything. The femur is straight, the patient is able to stand. If the patient breaks again the femur, it's gonna bend the nails. You're gonna have to cut the nails and it's gonna be much easier to remove the nails. From the fracture site. From the fracture site. That's true. So at this moment, it would be extremely difficult to remove the elastic nails. I, I agree with, with, your, uh, with your fears, but I will not touch it and wait and see. Mm -hmm. That's very uh, smart way. And uh, there is one case uh, uh, we operate on her in the, for the tibia. She's a six and a half uh, years old girl diagnosed uh, genetically and clinically with the pseudogenesis imperfecta. Her tibia was, uh, as you said, his, the fracture side is easier to remove from the side. But our talk here for the femur site. See, uh, the the wall uh, mechanical axis is, uh, is centered. We see, the, although the femur is varus, but the, if you see the line, mechanical uh, line is uh, passing through the knee, and she is having a compensating a compensating uh, valgus deformity in the distal femur. It's reaching 98. So. Uh, I believe, Dr. Galvan, if you would comment, Dr. Fasair, if we correct this femur, so she will have uh, exaggerated uh, valgus uh, distally. Is, it, is that true? Yeah, you're right. Uh, you're right. Because, uh, but uh, in this case, uh, we would like to, to you know, uh, do a plan. Um, here, there is an apex. Uh, I, I can't sign, but anyway. Uh, there is an apex in the middle, in the, the union of the proximal third and the middle third. There is a cora here in Barus, and uh, these Barus have two coras, I think. And then there is a, another cora of Valgus in the epiphysis. So in this case, uh, I think I can put the nail and I can treat the distal cora with a uh, guided growth, with uh, a plate or hinge plate or whatever you have. Medial side. Yeah, in the medial side. Yes. Right. Dr. Passer. Uh, I agree 100%. That's good. And uh, another case, uh, Dr. Ahmed would like to uh, speak uh, with us. Uh, Dr. Ahmed? Yes, uh, hi. Hello, Dr. Ahmed. Hello. Dr. Ahmed, uh, Turkistani from, uh, from Jeddah. 
Oh, my friend from Jeddah. <laughs> yeah, King Faisal Jeddah. Yes, yes. That the first time. Uh, hi. Uh, 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 how are you? It's, I'm very uh, well, thank you. Yourself? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. It's nice to see both of you safe and uh, it's uh, bringing lots of memories. Yes. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's nice to see you, Dr. Fasir, Dr. Galban. Uh, wonderful uh, lecture and uh, outstanding discussion. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for arranging this. Uh, I only want to add one thing. Uh, if you uh, let me, Dr. Fasir, Dr. Galban, uh, it's uh, something happened with me. As you remember, Dr. Fasir, I I I, I shared that case with you. Uh, I give uh, one advice to all the surgeons that if uh, they should screen all the cases for kyphos scoliosis deformity uh, to keep that in mind uh, when they're planning to do uh, lower extremity surgery. As you remember, Dr. Vasier, I shared my case with you, uh, that uh, boy with a severe uh, lower limb extremity and he has severe kyphos scoliosis and I took him uh, for... Uh, our extremity reconstruction and the uh, boy ended up uh, uh, paralyzed because of uh, prolonged surgery, uh, su uh, supine position and blood loss and uh, hypotension intraoperatively. Uh, this is something that uh, I experienced. I don't want anyone else to, to have the same. And uh, you remember that, Dr. Placier? Absolutely. And again, it's a good uh, moment to uh, say again what I just said a few minutes ago. You treat patients, you don't read x-rays. That's true. Well, thank you. And good to see you again. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Stay Stay safe. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Miguel, Dr. Fasel. Uh, when Dr. Mazen asking about the staging protocol of you having patient, uh, OI patient, both femur, both uh, tibias uh, uh, indicated for surgery. Uh, what's your usual uh, protocol? Um, I usually, when, when I have, uh, if the patient needs uh, a correction, deformity for both femurs and both tibia, normally I do two bones. I do femur and tibia on the same size. And in another surgery, three months later, I do femur and tibia. Um, I know there is some doctors that I, I really like. Uh, they're very good doctors, like uh, Dr. Paul Esposito in Omaha. He, he, he tried to do the four bones in the same surgery. But uh, because um, the patient's going to go to the um, unit care if you do four bones. So he's going to need more blood. So I prefer to do two and two. What do you think about that? I do two and two, but I try to do two and two one week or two weeks apart so that the patient will have just one post-op immobilization. That's going to be a tiny bit longer, but just one, instead of two times being either in a spike or immobilized. Okay. I see. And post-op protocol, uh, Dr. Fasel, Dr. Maget. Or that you will put a cast for the femur or uh, or a tibia. Yeah, for um, I use a lot of um, slaps, uh, braces. I prefer to use braces. I'm trying to do not use spikes if I can. If there, uh, but uh, the uh, I use uh, braces made of um, fiberglass. Uh, Prelude is one of the brands I use, uh, and so I try to immobilize with that. Uh, for tibia, for tibia, you can use a slab or you can use a brace also. Um, but because the most difficult thing is to control rotation. For tibia, it's easy to control rotation. You flex 30 to 40 degrees the knee, and you put the ankle in 90 degrees and you control rotation with a brace, even with a cast. But for femur, it's more difficult. If I do, um, um, maybe you can use, um, um, put a stick between the two legs as, a, as another way. But normally what I use 
is a kind of I I saw uh, I have shown you in Saudi Arabia how how I do it with um, preludes with uh, the fiberglass. Uh, I I do a kind of uh, spiker, but it's not a spiker. It's up in a spiker, and it works nicely. That's great. I hate spikers, so therefore I try not to use that. Uh, when I do relatively small children, uh, the tibia and the femur, I use a three-sided back slab, and I attach them with a tape, the large tape, about two inches wide. I attach the legs so that there is no ex automatic external rotation. That's a smart way. And uh, Dr. Fasad, uh, maybe this is the last question and we'll close, we reach the time. Uh, at the end, uh, uh, the distal tip of the uh, male component, there is a hole for the wires. Did you use it before to uh, augment the Bertius uh, distally? I didn't do the, the hole. Draw Pele asked for it after having seen my rod. But personally, I've used it maybe once but I don't use it because I don't think it's necessary. And it adds some you know, difficulties to the surgery, uh, very close to the joint. So I prefer not to use it. And I have seen, particularly in the distal tibia, I've seen that K wire migrating through the physis because the rod was not telescoping. I see. I've seen a case that was referred to me. And uh, personally, I don't think, uh, I, as I said, uh, a moment ago, I prefer to go down to the subchondral bone to have some good purchase for the threads of the male rather than use the, uh, the, the small hole. But I know that lots of people prefer to uh, kind of locking the system. Yes, I have used it only in uh, patients that uh, some surgeon before use it that retrograde nail, whatever nail you use it, could be a rush nail, and they put a rush nail a retrograde from knee to the head of the femur. I mean, retrograde. So the patient had a hole. So you don't have a place to hold the threads of the fascia dual rod when you put an antegrade. So in this case, the, maybe I have like three patients. I use the K wire to hold the fascia dual. It's the only cases I use it. Even I don't use it in uh, congenital arthrosis of the femur. I use the normal threads also. That's good. I think we reached the conclusion of this uh, fruitful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Magay. Thank you, Dr. Fasir. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we appreciate your presence. And uh, Dr. Miguel will see you on the next Monday, 11th of May, uh, 2020, in the same time. Okay, okay thank, you. Those are thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Pancho. Thank you, Miguel. Take care. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye bye.